Well, my name is JC Feldhuizen. Uh, I want to thank uh, Histori Bersama uh, for organizing this uh, seminar and uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with all of you. I will talk about my uh, political party, uh, about, the, uh, about racism in the Netherlands, and about the relation between Indo-Europeans and racism, and I will conclude with um, my perspective on fighting racism. So since last year, I'm a dual city council member in Amsterdam for the political party Bij A, and the pillars of our party are radical equality and economical justice which means we combine anti-racist, feminist, and queer politics with anti-capitalism. As a dual city council member for Bahrain, uh, anti-racism and decolonization is one of the themes that I'm responsible for. And just to give you an example of what I'm doing, I'll share one initiative I took. So the city of Amsterdam is currently in the research phase of a project focused on introducing a new curriculum on Dutch colonialism for all primary and secondary schools in Amsterdam. And looking at this project, I found out that the involvement of the Dutch in the slave trade in the region of the Indian Ocean wasn't mentioned at all. This is quite remarkable because the Dutch uh, shipped over uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of enslaved people across the Indian Ocean. Uh, fortunately, I succeeded uh, in gathering broad support from other political parties to include the Dutch involvement in slavery in the region uh, of the Indian Ocean in the new curriculum. So. Uh, Party, our political party is relatively new and still very small, but I think most people in the Netherlands, they, uh, are, uh, they know about us. But not because of our politics, though, mostly because the founder and leader of BAE is a black woman that speaks up against racism. As a result of her speaking up against racism, the leader of our party, Sylvana Simons, who is also our only city council member here in Amsterdam, has been dealing with masses of death threats. The threats uh, started coming in from the moment she first spoke out against uh, the racist blackface tradition Black Pete or Zwarte Piet on television back in 2015. And since then, the racist and sexist threats continue to this day. So the anger and hate that burst out as a result of uh, someone speaking up against racism, especially when this someone is a black woman, uh, says a lot about the problem of racism in the Netherlands. Uh, Professor Gloria Becker, in her book White Innocence, points out that there is a gaping absence of discussions on race in Dutch academia. In her book, Professor Wecker describes how the, Dutch, how the Dutch build up a cultural archive, which is a set of patterns in our knowledge, attitude, and emotions, based upon 400 years of colonial rule. As a result, the Dutch see uh, the Netherlands as a gentle and ethical nation, and in the same time, uh, racism and xenophobia is uh, passionately uh, being denied. But anyone who takes a, a deeper look at Dutch society will see right away that it's filled with subtle but also more blatant forms of racism. There are many examples. Um, I'll give you a, a few on uh, inter-institutional -inst racism in the Netherlands. So one, uh, colonial history and colonial villains are honored in public space as if colonialism is something to be proud of. Even mass murderers are being honored with big statues and streets named after them. Two, education materials are almost always based upon a Eurocentric perspective, often glorifying colonialism. In one school book, for example, and slave people that stood up against their colonial oppressors are being visualized as some kind of evil demons, as if it's them and not those who enslaved them uh, were uh, evil. Three, when ending primary school, children with a migration background structurally receive lower advice for their secondary school level than their white classmates with exact the same grades. Four, there is structural discrimination in the job market against people with a migration background. Literally every year another study is published that confirms this problem, even going so far that some employment agencies don't mind to work with companies that request only white employees. Five, and the last one, uh, the police violate human rights on a structural level. Um, even in Amsterdam, which is uh, far more progressive than the most of the rest of the Netherlands, the chief of police can stop police officers from ethnic profiling. Remind you that Amnesty International points out for many years already that ethnic profiling is a form of discrimination and a violation of human rights. 
But it's not only institutional racism that people of color have to deal with. In her book, Daily Racism, Professor Philomena Asset delves into the phenomenon of daily racism, which she defines as different types and forms of racism that racialized groups experience in everyday life when interacting with dominant white groups. I want to give credit to Professor Weckel and Professor Asset because they have made such important contributions to anti-racist thinking in the Netherlands and the anti-racism racism movement here, and I definitely advise you to read both uh, books if you want to uh, learn more about racism in the Netherlands, and both books are published in Dutch and in English. Um, from here on, I will mostly talk about my own cultural identities, since I'm a living product of Dutch colonialism, and thus a living product of Dutch racism. I'm what they call an Indo-European, which is described on Wikipedia as the following. In its narrowest sense, the term refers to people in the former Dutch East Indies who held European legal status but who were of mixed descent, that are descendants of various indigenous peoples of Indonesia and Dutch settlers. In the broadest sense, an Indo-European is anyone of mixed European and Indonesian descent. Okay, I think I'm going to do it like this. So my father was born in uh, Maidan on Sumatra from Indo-European parents in a time when the Netherlands was still considered uh, in the time when the Netherlands still considered Indonesia to be uh, to be their colony, and the Dutch roots on my father's side they lead back to the grandfather of my grandfather. He was the first Feldhausen to go to the Dutch East Indies, and this great grandfather of mine was an agricultural entrepreneur a rich and racist slave owner that never set foot on the ground because he was always carried around by enslaved people. His culture and his identity and his name, they were passed on in our family, but the culture's identities and the names of the indigenous women in my family fell into oblivion. Next to me, there are at least one and a half million other Indo-Europeans in the Netherlands. When I grew up, though, I barely met any Indo-Europeans that critically engaged with their identity and history. So this was one of the reasons for me to get together with Mare van Splinter, Sadiqa de Jong, Rochelle van Mane, and Bayou Junai, who is there, hello, uh, to start decolonization network uh, former Dutch East Indies, which is a grassroots initi initiative mainly focused on connecting uh, people who engage with the colonial history of the former Dutch East Indies in a critical way. Now a look at the role of Indo-Europeans in Dutch politics shows the necessity uh, and the urgency of our network. The only two extreme right-wing parties in the parliament are founded by Indo-Europeans. So Thierry Baudet, founder and the leader of uh, the Forum for Democracy, which, was the, which became the biggest party in the last elections, openly proclaimed, uh, among many other racist statements, that he thinks that Europe should stay dominantly white. Geert Wilders, founder and leader of the Freedom Party, was even convicted for the incitement uh, to discrimination for one of his many racist statements. And uh, Baudet and Wilders both want to close the borders and get rid of anti-discrimination laws and international human rights treaties. So if we want to but if we want to get a better understanding of the relationship between Indo-Europeans and racism, we need to take a deeper look at uh, colonial history in the former Dutch East Indies. In his book, Dunyai de Concunibate in the Dutch East Indies, Reggie Bai describes how the influx of male white Europeans into the Dutch colony led to the creation of Indo-European children, not uncommonly as a result of rape of enslaved indigenous women. Although some of these children were raised as Europeans, their mixed blood made them inferior to white people in the colonial racist hierarchy. These people had indigenous blood, so they were seen as unreliable, manipulating, dumb, and undeveloped. Many of them became outcasts in colonial society. At some point, though, as Reggie Bai describes, the Dutch started to realize that the growing group of Indo-Europeans living in impoverished conditions could become a threat for the colonial order. So in the end of the 19th century, a Dutch member of parliament called upon the government to take action because, and I quote, this is the duty of the state and it's in our own interest because the growing race of impoverished Indos hates us with an unstoppable hate and this hate is not undeserved, unquote. 
So around the turn of the around the turn of the century, the colonial government and its colonial and the colonial civil society started organizing initiatives focused on improving the situation of the impoverished Indo-Europeans. But not so much because they cared about their well-being, mostly because they wanted them to become part of, part of the oppressing colonial system instead of them revolting against it. Around the same time, Indo-Europeans started organizing themselves. The biggest Indo-European organization, the Indo-Europees Verbond, was founded in 1990. Characteristic for the Indo-Europees Verbond was that they saw the indigenous people as unwelcome competitors who received more benefits from the colonial government than them. The fact that the Indo-Europees Verbond became the biggest Indo-European organization, uh, organization says a lot about the position of Indo-Europeans in the colonial racist hierarchy and the fact that many of them internalized racism instead of rejecting it. So instead of fighting the colonial occupation side by side with the indigenous anti-colonial freedom fighters, most Indo-Europeans chose to align themselves with the colonial oppressor. Sometimes because they were simply raised as Europeans and thus identified as such, sometimes because poverty led them no other choice than to join the colonial army. When the Dutch finally recognized the independence of Indonesia, after they killed more than 100,000 people in an attempt to maintain their colony, most Indo-Europeans fled to the Netherlands. And so did my family, most of my family, although a lot of them quite quickly uh, moved out because it was too cold and rainy here. <laughs> so although the colony wasn't uh, there anymore, the internalization of racism in Indo-European communities continued. And my comrade Sarah Kledex wrote the following about this in her article named The Decolonization of the Indo. The Indo-European culture is a result of mixed marriages and it's formed by Indonesian and European influences. The culture arose within the power of structure of Dutch colonialism. This means that our thinking and the knowledge that we see as true is taught, up, is taught to us from, from this colonial perspective. Inherent to this colonial perspective is racism. In the Dutch East Indies, people were very clear in making distinctions in skin color and race, and we learned, most, mostly unconsciously, to see everything that is white or European as higher, more beautiful, and better. We are not only projecting this white ideal on the world around us, we also pro project it on our own culture and our own self-image." So, when we have all of this in the back of our minds, we can get a better understanding of the relationship between Indo-Europeans and racism. Of course, this was a very limited summary of uh, a way more uh, complex history, but looking at this history brings me to the conclusion that it's time for a revolution among Indo-Europeans. Instead of holding on to the colonial way of thinking that was forced upon, our, uh, was forced upon or internalized by our ancestors, I argue that we should decolonize our way of thinking. For me personally, this decolonization process is about researching and reviving my indigenous roots, but also it's about changing my way of thinking and doing. In the words of the amazing Bell Hooks, when radical activists have not made a core break with dominator thinking, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, there is no union of theory and practice, and real change is not sustained. That's why cultivating the mind of love is so crucial. When love is the ground of our being, a love ethic shapes our participation in politics. Instead of aligning ourselves with white supremacists, I argue that we should fight racism in broad coalitions, build upon the principles of solidarity, intersectionality, and anti-capitalism. We should acknowledge that we can only win the struggle against racism if we have the masses on our side, we should acknowledge that different forms of oppressions are connected and interacting with each other. And finally, uh, we should acknowledge that we uh, need to fight capitalism if we want to overcome racism. In the words of Malcolm X, you can't have capitalism without racism. Thank you. Thank you.